Uh, good afternoon or oh, good evening, all participants. I am Matanga Pereira, the Vice President of IESL WA chapter, opening the forum today on behalf of our President Seneca. Um, I'm uh, pleased to welcome you all to our monthly CPD seminar session. This is uh, the February 23 seminar titled as uh, Challenges in Grid-Connected uh, Solar Farm energization, energization, as presented by Dr. Arashani Lamabadi. Um, IESL committee member Parakram Indunil, um, who coordinates this session, uh, will introduce the speaker shortly. Uh, may I convey uh, gratitude of ISLWA uh, to Dr. Aroshini for her offer and efforts for making this session possible. Uh, the importance or significance of uh, current applications, uh, developments, and future markets, and the challenges with solar technology have become uh, major topics amongst uh, the engineers, specialists, and uh, end users of renewable energy sector, as you all know. Uh, recent statistics show that the global demand for solar energy has grown up exponentially over the past decade and is predicted to be rising over the years to come. So the percentage share of share of uh, solar energy across the global renewable energy supply has grown uh, significantly and the curve is uh, continually on a rise. Uh, so I guess hence the reason uh, challenges that solar technology faces uh, is important for us as engineering professionals and end users. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Aroshini will present her experience on uh, challenges with energization of solar farms connected to grid today. Uh, may I kindly request uh, Parakram Indunil to introduce our speaker and invite her uh, to commence uh, this interesting session. Thanks. Thank you, Mathanga. That's our Vice President for ISWA chapter. So yeah, this is our second one, second uh, the webinar uh, in this uh, period of time. So it's the first one in uh, 2023, February. Uh, well, uh, let me introduce Dr. Aroshini. So, Dr. Aroshini, Dr. Diana Aroshini Lamabadu. So, uh, she is graduated from Faculty of Engineering, University of Rohuna in 2007. So, completed her PhD in Electrical Engineering in Curtin University in Perth, in Western Australia, in 2016. So, who supervisor was uh, Professor Sumedha Rajukarna, who is actually the professor of uh, power engineering at Curtin University. Also a very active member of ISL WA chapter. And during her academics uh, uh, periods, uh, she received several uh, academic awards. So to name a few of them, uh, Dr. ADB Arirat uh, Memorial Gold Medal, for the best academic performance throughout the four years of undergraduate period. That's a study during the University of Rohuna in the Faculty of Engineering. And then uh, two of and the two others from uh, Curtin University and Australian scholarships, the Australian Postgraduate Award Scholarship, and also the Curtin University Postgraduate Scholarship. And also in 2018, uh, she received the, the graduate engineer or the cadet engineer award from IESL WA chapter. Yeah, 
So a little bit, uh, if I talk about a little bit about her career, uh, after the graduation, she, she started as a telecommunication engineer at Ericsson Lanka, Ericsson, Ericsson Communications Lanka. And in 2009, she was working as a, uh, also a visiting lecturer to the uh, University of Fruhuna, Department of Electrical Engineering, Electrical and Information Engineering. From 2009 to 10, uh, she worked as an electric, electrical engineer at uh, Ceylon Electricity Board in Colombo. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, after that, actually, she did her PhD in Perth, in Curtin, Curtin University. And now she's uh, uh, finally uh, working in the Balanced Services Group, uh, which more focuses on the solar and renewable energy uh, uh, areas. So uh, on top of that, uh, going, going back to her publications, so uh, she has done a number of publications uh, uh, which are wrapped around her research areas. Uh, so there are about six publications she has done. Uh, that's uh, 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 during the, uh, her study and PhD in Curtin University. Uh, these are basically in the three phase the, the induction motors, induction generators, uh, using for single phase applications, et cetera, et cetera. So that was uh, uh, theoretical part and also the practical part was conducted here. And apart from the induction motors, she had made the two publications uh, on large scale solar uh, photovoltaic uh, plants in rural Australia. So being actually a, uh, the huge uh, landmass in Western Australia, it gives a lot of opportunities to use uh, the solar power, also uh, a reed landscape. And so a lot of applications are going on. And uh, so those are the two, and these ones actually, these publications came on in the IEEE. And these details are also in, the, uh, in her profile uh, in the LinkedIn. So uh, please uh, feel free to go there and uh, read these ones and uh, also make the, uh, the connections with uh, uh, Haroshini in the, in the LinkedIn page. Uh, so apart from that, I think uh, I think give a brief introduction. Uh, let me uh, share the flow uh, to open the flow to Haroshini to uh, conduct the presentation. Yeah, thanks, Arashini. Arashini, you are muted. Hello, Arashini, you are muted. Yeah, yeah. I know, the host, host muted me. All right, okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, thank you, Parakto. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Arvashani. Welcome to our webinar. So let me to share my screen to start the presentation. Today, uh, I'm going to speak about the some of the challenges we met during the designing and commissioning and energization of large scale uh, grid connected solar farms. Before starting the presentation, I think I'm giving you a brief introduction about this renewable energy. It's just for the completion of this pre presentation. I know most of you in here already know about these things. This is just for the completion. What is Renewable energy. Renewable energy is not the energy sources which used in the past as conventional energy sources like coal, oil, natural gas. Because of the drawbacks of those uh, conventional energy sources, because they are not um, available 
uh, in a large scale now these days. It is rapidly depletion. Then the uh, impact to the environment, especially global warming, people wanted to find some other alternative sources as the energy sources, especially in Australia, because of the tax imposed on carbon emission, most of the mining giants in Australia wanted to invest on um, renewable energy sources to replace the conventional energy sources. Solar, wind, hydro, bioenergy, those are uh, the most popular types of renewable energy sources in the world. So in this chart, you can see the Australian electricity generation from renewable energy sources. It is clear that the popularity of solar energy has increased from 2010 to 2020 in a significant amount. This is the different types of solar energy connection. The first type is grid connected solar. It's like household solar system, but in large scale also we can do the same thing. So PV is connected to the grid. It should be, it is actually more complex network than this, but this is just the representation. In the second system, oh, the drawback of the first system is if the grid is not available, PV is not available to because PV doesn't have the grid reference. It means PV doesn't know the voltage and frequency. So we can't operate the PV if the grid is not available. But in the second system, we have improved the situation. We have connected batteries in parallel to the PV. So the battery can supply uh, reference voltage and frequency when there's a grid outage. So the, the customers will not affect if we are connecting to the, um, the PV is supplying the load. In the third one, it is the standalone system. So it is the same concept as in the second system. Instead of the grid, we have a generator. This one's actually standalone system is really important for um, rural Australia because the network is not available and even the network is available, there are a lot of network outages. So the network operator is prepared to go for standalone uh, TV systems for the rural area. So this is the um, connection for that um, standalone system. So the battery will um, provide the reference for the PV. In case of um, battery state of charge is um, at it is minimal and the PV is not available, generator, is, well, generator works as the backup energy source. So now we are in our real topic, the challenges in grid connected solar farm energization. It's actually not, um, this is actually, we can't uh, separate what is energization, what is commissioning and what is design. So all together, we have to talk about um, it's as a one topic. There are a lot of challenges, but today because of this time limitation and the things, so I'm only presenting three main challenges we are facing these days. Um, first one is transformer in Russian over current protection. The second one is arc flash incident due to network faults. Third one is harmonics and power quality at the point of connection. Transformer in Russia. As you know, trans, when we um, energize the transformer, let's say we supply the um, current from the pr uh, primary side of the transformer. So then that current can make a flux in the core. That flux can create the voltage and then we can energize the transformer. Because of the non-linearity of this core and it is saturation effect, during the energization, that core, especially this magnetizing inductance, draw a huge amount of current from the grid. The grid can supply the current, it is not an issue. So what is the issue here? Because of that 
high um, significant current, our protection system can trip due to overcurrent issue. So here I'm providing a very simple um, diagram just to visualize what is happening. So this PV is connected to the inverter, PV inverter, then to a transformer and then to the grid. So this uh, transformer is protected uh, from the protection device. If you work on the protection side, you know, we have to um, configure these protection relays depending on a lot of required. First one is transformer rated current and the um, uh, fault, fault contribution from the grid and the PV inverter. So we have, uh, typically, we have two regions in protection relays. First one is IDMT region. It is inverse time minimum, sorry, in, uh, inverse definite minimum time region and the definite time region. So this curvy part is IDMT region. Um, and this is a definite region. We can have two definite region, one with um, uh, some definite time delay and one instantaneous still without any delay. So it is instantaneous trip. This pickup normally is the 1.2 times transformer rated current. So I'm just considering because uh, these simulations I've done in a long time ago, it has done for 6.6 .6 kVA transformer. So here I'm um, demonstrating the same calculation because I want to use the same plots here. It is, it is 1.1 MVA transformer, 6.6 .6 K um, connected to the 6.6 .6 kV bus. It's, let's say this is 6.6 .6 kV bus and this is 0.1 MVA transformer. So the rated current on the HV side of the transformer is 8.7. This IDMT pickup should be 8.7 times 1.2, 10.5. And this um, uh, definite time pickup, we normally uh, set this to pick up the minimum three phase fold current on the transformer LV side, this side. And this I, um, instantaneous pickup, we said to detect the uh, maximum three phase fold current on the transformer LV side. You can see from this plot during this is during energization at the initially transformer um, is disconnected from the system. During the energization, you can see three phase currents. IA is the, um, this red one is the uh, phase A, and other two are phase B and C. So in here, you can see at the energization, the phase current is about 60. Um, sorry, nearly 60, it's around 50 amp. But rated current is 8.7 amp. That is a huge amount of current compared to the rated current of the transform. Normally for large transformers, this um, ratio is um, like uh, six to eight. And in a small transformers, it's like 10 to 12. So if we run the, uh, if we energize this transformer without making any precautions, so the transformer can trip during the, this region or this region. That is a, a challenge we are facing because we are setting up these we are uh, setting up these uh, values for the protection of our system, depending on the protection of the upstream breakers or upstream relays. So this grading margin, uh, because uh, these are grading uh, due to the grading margin required for for the upstream protection. So the transformer protection uh, due to transformer in rush, we will trip our system. So we can't energize the system like this. We need to find a solution for that. That is what the first challenge today. So this is the PSCAD simulation 
for the results I showed you before. So uh, this transformer is a um, second side is open for the simulation only uh, supplied from the grid. So you can see um, this current is about 50 amp. It is reducing with the time, but until here, until 1.1, 1 1.1, uh, that current is 40 amp. When uh, time is 1.2, it is like after 200 milliseconds. So that current is 30 amp. For this, um, I did again this simulation in um, Dixelon Power Factor software for you to visualize what is happening during energization. So because of this setting, let's say this uh, DD pickup is uh, 110 millisecond. At 110 millisecond, so you can see what is this fault uh, in rush current is 40. So I have just put, um, oh, I put it's uh, 110. So it is, we consider as 35, but it is actually higher than that. So because of this high current, the transformer trip after 110 millisecond. So just after we start the system to energize the uh, transformer, transformer trip. So we can't energize the transformer. What is the solution here? What caused this inrush current? This plot shows for the phase A, phase or A of the same transformer, how the harmonics look like. I'm just plotting you uh, the most important harmonics only. Um, this one shows second, uh, first, first is fundamental and second and fifth harmonic. Because normally um, in, for the inrush, main reason is the second harmonic and fifth harmonic. So you can see clearly this green line is the uh, fundamental, orange line is the second harmonic, you can see the second harmonic is almost half of the fundamental current during the energization. With the time, um, we can energize the transformer within the safe region. So our method is in these days, all the uh, protection relays, most of the protection relays have this capability. So it can calculate the um, percentage of second harmonic to the uh, fundamental harmonic. And when it reach some desired value, whatever the values we have set earlier, it can block part of that second harmonic content. So we can safely operate and we can safely energize the mm, transformer during energization. So if the percentage of harmonic content is greater than a desired value, normally it is 15 to 20% of the fundamental value. So we can select what is the value we need. Protection relay is capable of blocking second and or fifth harmonic. We can set either only for the second harmonic or we can set both second and fifth harmonic. So that uh, relay is capable of um, blocking that content. Then we can safely energize our transport. Then the arc flash. Arc flash is a very hot topic in Australia. So people want to um, know the arc flash level. It's because of mainly because of the um, safety of the people, workers, or the public. So. Before we energizing, we have to provide this all information and even the labels for all the equipment who, which other people can access. And then we have to set up the boundaries. These are the boundaries for the arc flash. You can't access these areas. That kind of information we have to provide before the energization. So there can be two different types of arc flash in the solar farm because we know uh, PV will generate DC current and we can, if there's a network fault, we can get the fault contribution from both the grid and the PV. If I go here, let's say if there's a fault here, 
uh, forward on the transformer HV. So the grid, this grid can supply the contribution to the fall. This solar farm can supply to the contribution to the fall. So we have two types of arc flash in the solar farm. Um, factors affecting incident energy. The uh, factors for this incident energy are system voltage. Definitely this uh, arc flash depends on the system voltage. If system voltages are high, the arc flash level is high. Then arc in current. If arc in current is high, so our protection devices tend to um, open the breakers faster. So the incident energy is lower. If the arc in current is lower, our um, protection devices are slow. When they are slower, that incident energy is high. So factors are system voltage, arc in current. Arc in current is mainly the fall current or for the voltage as about 15 kilowatt, the, uh, yes, for the voltage about 15 kilowatt, Arc current is same as the fall current, but for the lower voltages, arc current is less than the fall current. Then arc duration. Arc duration is the time the first protection device acts. The first protection device open the breaker and clear the fault. It is the arc duration. Then the working distance. Working distance is the distance from the energy source to the person who's, uh, ex who's going to expose to the arc flash if there's any incident that distance is the arc source to the person these are the uh, things actually need to do before the energization um, uh, we have to calculate the uh, incident energy using the four, um, equations given for given in the standard if it is a uh, zero calories per square centimeters centimeter scared, we don't need to use the protective equipment, but if it is for the category one protective equipment we have to wear, if it is uh, eight calories per square centimeter, then category two protection, uh, protective equipment. If it is category three, this is the uh, equipment and the category four. If it is above 40 calories per uh, centimeter squared, we can't work in that situation because there's no any protective equipment for that kind of incident energy. So people can, it, it is really bad for people's health, maybe fatal. So these are the boundaries. We can set up the boundaries. Let's say if it is near, um, inside the uh, arc flash source, arc source, we can't work like that. So we need some boundaries. So we can set up this boundary and label that, okay. Within this boundary, you have to wear this kind of protective equipment. If it is something far away, okay, this is the um, equipment, uh, protective equipment you have to wear, or it is further away from the arc source. So you are safe. You can work after this, boundary without wearing any protective equipment. That kind of information we need to provide for the people on site before the energy session. So there are different kinds of methods to calculate the arc flash. So for the AC arc flash, the, there are the standard, the standard method to calculate the AC arc flash. One is Lee method. It is for voltages about 15 kilowatt. Other one is IEEE method, IEEE 1584 method. It is the for the voltage lower than 15 kilowatt. These methods actually um, given in the standard, but is still a flash. As no one knows how how it is happening, why it is happening, how how it is measured. That kind of information, no one can understand or no one can measure. In the DC arc flash, there are some um, equations given in the standard for the DC batteries. 
but our one is a DC PV. For PV is different to the battery because battery is a voltage source, PV is a current source. In the voltage source, voltage is always there. In the current source, current is always there. Because of that, we can't use the equations given for the uh, battery system. That is the main challenge we are facing here. How we calculate the DC arc flash for the PV system. These are the um, calculation and mitigation of AC arc flash risk. We can use some manual calculations using the equations. Those equations are available even in the online. Then you can use software tools if it is available for you to use, then online calculation um, calculators. Mitigation methods for the uh, AC arc flash, we can calculate, then um, we can install uh, arc flash detection protective devices, something like a relay. So it can sense the light and heat, then it can send the signal to the breaker, corresponding breaker, okay, I detected the arc flash trip. It is instantaneous. Instantaneous means um, there's communication delay and arc flash detection delay, but it is really small. So it is instantaneous. So we can protect the people and equipment from the AC arc flash. For the cal all the calculations we have done for whole system in the side, we have to given the labels with the incident energy. What is the energy if arc flash happen? There can be different things because uh, the fault can be maximum or minimum. So we have to provide the worst case in the label. Incident energy, uh, flash boundary, what is the safest uh, distance you have to work? Or what, in which region we ha you have to use which kind of PPE? Then mark the boundaries and restrict the access where the appropriate PP. Sorry. This is the challenging part, as I told you earlier, DC arc flash. For, to calculate the DC arc flash in uh, the business, we use some empirical formula because as I told you, uh, we can't use the equations given for the batteries. But the equations we use here to calculate the PV arc flash is not in the standard. So it can be right or it can be wrong. But based on the theory and experimental results, we believe those equations are, we can use those equations at some uh, degree of accuracy to calculate the AC arc flash. A um, lot of things are uncertain in this topic. Because of that, we use two seconds as the arc duration because we are not sure the time the protective, uh, the fuses will blow. Sometimes the time to blow the fuses will be higher than two seconds. Why we selected this two seconds? Two seconds is the um, time a person can um, run away from the arc source if he or she notice an arc that two second is, uh, is enough for some person to run away from the arc source. That is in the standard. So we use two second for our calculation. Unfortunately, I can't provide you the equations here, what we use because it is someone's um, research and someone's publication. So without their approval, I'm unable to provide the equations here. Um, then the short circuit current, of the PV panel is considered as the arc current. That's short circuit current actually, not just for the PV panel. Uh, how to calculate the um, 
depends on the connection of the PV strings, how many PV strings connected in parallel to one inverter. So that is the, no, uh, yeah, that is the uh, total short circuit current or the arc current for the PV uh, inverter, for the DC PV inverter. That um, short circuit current actually given at a standard condition, a standard temperature, a standard wind speed, that kind of, uh, and uh, 1000 watts per meter squared uh, solar irradiance. That is also one limitation. So we are calculating for standard conditions, not the um, real condition. So for as the mitigation method, uh, we um, same as AC arc flash, we can label, we can give whatever the calculations we have done. Um, this is the arc uh, incident energy, this is the PP requirement, and these are the boundaries. So we can make the boundaries and restrict the access to public or the staff during energization. If someone has to access those areas during energization, they need to wear the correct PP um, for that equipment. Take follow, following precautions if the PP level is above category four. As I told you, if it is category four, we, uh, any of the protective equipment will not support you. It is your safety. You have to take these precautions because if it is above category four, you will get severe burns if you enter those areas during energization or during maintenance or whatsoever work you are doing on site. So if it is category four for the PV farm, we are proposing you can do the maintenance after the sun hours, after the peak sun hours. Because during peak sun hours, in this one, you can see during peak sun hours, solar irradiance is 1000 watts per meter square or above. During the, it depends on the month for the Australia, but for Sri Lanka, definitely it is, could be same value for a whole month, a whole year. So avoid all PV maintenance during the peak sun hours, then rotate PV panels away from the sun. That is the um, most safest thing we have We have to do. We can, if actually this is not applicable, it is fixed system, but if it is a uh, access uh, system, a tracking system, so you can turn the uh, PV away from the sun. So then, solar irradiance is lower than what is the peak value. And then it is safe to work on site with lower PP categories. That is the second challenge we are facing these days. So it is it's still unsure what we have to do, but based on our experience and our research, and we think experimental equations we use in are adequate to provide um, labels and details with a, um, some um, degree of accuracy. Third one is harmonics and power quality. Before and after energization of the um, solar farm, we have to provide what will be the expected harm power quality on site after commissioning the solar farm and what will be the actual power quality after commissioning the solar farm. So how can we do this? We have to model the whole system, whole solar farm on whatever the software you use in the industry. So then model um, the solar farm in that uh, software and include all the possible information which will affect the um, power quality of the solar farm or power quality of the point of connection. Then, uh, based on those modeling, provide uh, the network provider. These are the um, power quality we are expecting after commissioning the solar farm. Then, if it is exceeding, if the modeling result shows we are exceeding some power, uh, some harmonics or some flicker values, then we have to. Actually, it's not we have to. 
even after uh, even without any issues with the modeling we have to uh, measure and analyze the power quality after commissioning and then compare with the modeling results and see this is what uh, we propose uh, we expected this is what actually we have uh, obtained and it is under the uh, limits or if it is uh, exceed in the limits we have to provide mitigation method how we mitigate this um, power, um, power quality issues. So ensuring the integration of PV system does not affect the power quality at the point of connection. So for that one, we have to do the power system modeling. These are the standard we use in uh, Australia. We use IEC standard. These are the voltage, um, harmonic voltage percentages as a percentage of the uh, fundamental. And the THD, total harmonic distortion, should be six, uh, less than 6.5%. And these are the flicker, long-term flicker and short-term flicker. The, um, when we are going to model this one, we have a lot of limitations because the model we have in the model, we have to model all the inverters, cables, transformers, PV panels, um, then uh, bus bars and the network. Most of this information we need for the modeling are not available in, from the manufacturer, especially for the cables. They don't provide us the um, yeah, inductance and capacitance. They just provide us the inductance and capacitance for the rated frequency, but the frequency dependent pre, uh, inductance and capacitance are not available from the manufacturer because for the harmonics, we know it is 50, 100, 150, like that, our frequency is increasing, but those for those frequencies, those inductance details or capacitance details are not available. Even for the transformers, the same, some transformer details not provided by the manufacturer. And the inverter. If it is the inverter, during the model, we have to model the inverter using uh, Thevenin's not and Thevenin's equivalent impedance. Also, we have to model the harmonic spectrum from the inverter. Then only we can um, consider the harmonic um, emission from the inverters, PV inverters. Also, Harm, uh, PV invert is a one source and uh, the grid is another source for the harmonics. Most of the time, those details or the models are not available for the point of connection. The grid details are not available. Um, the harmonic spectrum is not given. If it is not given, we are unsure the harmonic. Um, emission from the solar farm is the actual emission on the point of connection or it will add it or it will suppress, we are not sure uh, after adding the grid. That is one, uh, that is some limitations. Also, there are some software limitations as well. So the power quality model we are providing before the energization is not again 100% accurate. It's same as the arc arc flash, a PV arc flash. For example, I'm showing you this one, um, this harmonics at point of connection with and without cable capacitance. This one shows with cable capacitance um, for all the frequencies, I have used the same capacitance at 50 Hertz frequency. In this one, I have uh, remove the uh, cable capacitance for the harmonics. Use that um, cable capacitance only for the 50 hertz. Can you see the difference? So this one in the higher order harmonics, this harmonic percentages is significantly high, but this not may not be actual, but we don't know. Here, this all the harmonics, Actually, harmonics uh, in the real harmonics are in green color. The red one is the uh, standard limits. So all the PV um, voltage harmonics at point of connection is less than the limits. They are well within the limit. So our solutions for the modeling 
collect all the possible information as much as we can. Then based on that, and then get the power quality, uh, the harmonic spectrum for the point of connection. Based on those details, prepare the uh, power quality report at the point of connection before energization. And it is actually after assuming our solar farm is in a, uh, connected to the network. Then uh, submit that those details to network provider. So we are energizing our solar farm based on those details. After that, after real energization, measure the actual power quality data and then compare them with the um, modeling data. And if it is, if something is exceeding, actually exceeding the limits, so then propose the mitigation method. So that is the third um, most confusing thing during uh, the solar farm energization. I think that is all I have to present. If someone has some questions, I'm happy to answer. Hello, Martha and Phil. Thank you very much, Aroshini. It's a very interesting one. And uh, especially thanking you with your uh, with, uh, work with the domestic work and with the two children. So with our short notice, and it's really, I mean, uh, great that you, were, you didn't hesitate to take part in this and share your knowledge. That's much appreciated. And okay. if you have, yeah, if you have any questions, okay, uh, Tirantha is uh, raising up hand. Uh, Tirantha, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for a very informative lecture. Uh, I have a small question. During uh, yeah. harmonic analyzing, are we doing a time series analyzing based on irradiation data or it's a, just a snapshot? Oh, we have to use a special tool. Uh, we use here a metral meter. So we get the uh, data for seven days and then um, convert it to, uh, it, is, it is time series. Time series. Yeah, time series. Okay, yeah. So the cloudy effect also included in this analysis? Yes, be because we are um, measuring for the seven days, including the nighttime assay. So okay. then uh, we can Thanks. analyze what is happening during the nighttime because nighttime TV is not working. So it is yeah. definitely the grid. So we can analyze like that way and say, okay, this is um, even during nighttime, we notice this issue. So it is it can't be something related to the solar farm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And until uh, we get, uh, do you have the, any questions on the chat? Yeah. yeah. So there are two. So there's uh, one question from Kushan Marambi. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between the typical distribution transform and PV transformer when considering the inrush current? Um, there's no actually a difference like that. It depends on the transformer size. If the transformer size is higher, um, all the transformers have in that inrush. If the transformer is bigger, the uh, transformer in rush is uh, six to eight times of the rated current. If the um, smaller transformer, uh, that transformer in rush is 10 to 12 times the uh, rated current. Okay, I think that answers the question. Uh, and then there's another question. How, what's the maximum capacity solar farm in WV? And what are the challenges when connecting to a grid? with the generators, the case for mine sites? Um, with the generators, like big machines, actually that the power quality is the issue. Machines, actually not the solar farm, the big machines are the um, causing that uh, harmonics. That is the challenge after commissioning and then maximum capacity um, there's no such capacity. Actually, we're working on 50 megawatts solar farm at the moment. It depends on... Um, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, depends on the area and the money they like to invest. 
Right, right. Yeah, we have some answer from our colleague from Western Power. So mm -hmm. he did mention that it's uh, 100 megawatt. Thanks, Chadra, for that. Uh, so that's another question. Uh, come, do you think the transformer fail rate increase due to solar integration? No, there's no such thing. Transformer can't fail due to solar integration. Mm -hmm. Because we yeah. have protection. If something fail, we can um, isolate that part. So the transformer can't fail due to yeah. solar. Right, right. So the question from Daham, what are concerns when selecting transformers for large scale solar integration like 20 to 30 megawatt? Uh, concerns normally we go for a reputed manufacturer. Um, we need can to you, consider, sorry? Can you prescribe some? If you don't mind, some of the- um, it, it depends on the design. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that uh, other thing is the voltage impedance. Mm -hmm. So the voltage depend on the voltage impedance. A lot of things change, but we can't uh, cha change the voltage. It means not change. We can't, uh, yeah, we can't change the voltage, voltage impedance. It is there. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So actually in the, this balance uh, <coughs> the system design, right? So the company Aroshin is working with, and uh, she's engaged with like uh, the dynamic models, the steady state models and modeling the results and experimental results. Uh, and also like, uh, 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 what are the other things Aroshini uh, are currently engaging? Currently engaging with the uh, base system, uh, right. some issues. It's actually not our work. Someone else has done that one, and we are fixing the issues they have. And mm -hmm. yeah, some protection stuff, protection issues with some microgrid, and then implementing some other um, control mechanics for uh, the microgrids. Right. Right, right. So we have a few more questions, a couple of questions. Uh, uh, are you recommending uh, K-factor transformers for solar plants or normal transformers? I'm sorry, I can't understand and I can't give any answer for that one. Yeah. The next one. Yeah, so the next one, when selecting transformer uh, uh, for solar plants. Yeah, that's going so right. On There's on. Is it possible to have net yeah. metering system for the solar system with capacity lesser than maximum demand of the premises? Um, in here, what is happening? We can't export total um, exp uh, total generation. It depends on each each site is different. It depends on the site to site. And sometimes we can, uh, the limitation is 9.9 um, .9 megawatt if we are um, exporting to the network. And otherwise you have to, if you are generating more, but your load is not that much, you have to store, you have to think about some storage solution. So in the nighttime when the PV is not there, you can use that uh, storage for the load. So, Net metering system. Yeah, it, it is it is actually can't answer because it depends on the situation, how it is happening. If it is in Sri Lanka, is there any um, grid export limit? But in here, it, it depends. It dip, different site has different uh, export limits. Some sites, it's zero export. That's the regulation or is from the yeah, regulation? Yeah, it or? depends. Yeah. It depends on the site. So we were asked, okay, we, we have um, zero export here. We have 9.9 um, .9 megawatt export here, something like that. Probably maybe on the, the capabilities on the grid also, maybe, right? Yes, it is grid regulation, probably. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Uh, uh, so that's another question, yeah. Uh, when selecting a transformer for solar plants, uh, let's say one megawatt, uh, what is the largest least margin should be given? It's 1.2 MVA? Or... Um, it is actually uh, the size of solar farm. It is not the transformer. If let's say uh, solar DC is 1.2, let's say uh, for the ratio, for the uh, easier say, ratio, 1.25 MVA uh, solar farm, you can use one megawatt inverter, one megawatt transform. It, it is same as, if it is same as an uh, inverter, your PV inverter, that is enough. But your PV is higher than the inverter size. It is a uh, 1.3 or 1.25. Uh, there's another one. Uh -huh. Are there any specifications or standards for transmission level, interconnection, or large scale solar farms in Australia? There are a lot of specifications, standard. We have to follow all the Australian standard for everything, even fencing and everything. We have to follow the standard. So, are the, is that all? Um, I think, uh, yeah, on the chat, that's all. Yeah, and the hum, uh, there's think, another uh, one just came in. Where uh, you find those? Where do you find standards? the standards? Okay. You have to buy the standards. Buy the standard, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Maybe we can provide him some sources, or I mean, uh, where to buy, and if he, if you send us the email. Yeah. Uh, the hum. I think that's question from the hum. So another one. a little bit, uh, yeah. Okay, so what are the There's methods? another one, yeah. There's, what are the methods, devices used for MV harmonic measurements? Um, it is actually a uh, true current transformer. You can, uh, we are using um, a metro meter and uh, even you can use some L-spec meter. Mm -hmm. yeah, different meters are there. Are now available in the market that uh, metal meter you don't need to install you can just connect and get the measurement and bring it back uh, to office so but uh, elspec it is permanent <clears throat> all right okay, okay uh, good. are there any more um, questions uh, the audience it's five o'clock five five actually five four yeah uh, if not, uh, then we can wind up the session. I will drop a message to the chat right now. Right. And uh, that tells you uh, the email address where you need to send your full name uh, for us to issue the uh, CPT certificate. There's another one, uh, Dammika. There's another question. Is there is any there, issue no. to install ground and roof mounted solar to be that one system? No, that's not an issue. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Um, let's wind up then this session. Um, let me thank a few uh, people on behalf of IESLWA. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Aroshini for delivering this uh, illustrious uh, presentation on a highly demanding and uh, fast developing uh, topic, which is uh, solar energy harvesting. And uh, I guess this, is, this was a memorable presentation. We had about 57 participants. Um, Next, I would like to thank engineers, uh, Institute of Engineers Sri Lanka for facilitate, facilitating our webinars and uh, allocation of time and resources. Thank you, Chamila, uh, for your continuous technical and uh, logistical support uh, that you are providing from Control Center in Sri Lanka. 
Again, at, uh, next, uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, ISL WA committee member uh, Parakram Indunil uh, for proposing and coordinating this session with the speaker, uh, Dr. Arashini. And um, also, I would like to thank uh, editor uh, Tarindu, ISL WA editor. Uh, for coordinating and uh, uh, making these flyers and doing uh, various tasks. Uh, then I would like to thank uh, Dr. Seneca, our president, ISLWA, and uh, Mahesh, our secretary, for all the groundworks they have done, and also all other committee members and uh, of um, ISLWA for numerous works they made to make this session a success. And uh, also I'd like to thank all participants once again uh, for attending the CPD webinar and making um, it a success. And I hope you all had an informative session and um, have a good night and we will post your CPD sites in due course. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Matanga. Yeah, good. Uh, just uh, thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you for uh, yeah. Thank you for inviting me for this one. Yeah. It was a bit challenging than the challenges in Solar Farm. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, I know it's been well, the time. Well for, yeah, yeah, you did well. Yeah, you did well. Yeah. No, uh, it's. Uh, I saw oh. someone is asking uh, the email address. If yeah, you can, can I yeah. share? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll just type it, uh, paste it here. Okay, so this is, uh, yeah, thanks, Seneca, for your nice words, very good session. And uh, this, uh, the, the two, two things that I would like to uh, remind you, so we will issue a we will issue a uh, certificate of appreciation. And and also don't forget to join us with uh, uh, for the uh, ISL dinner, ISL get together in 26th August uh, this year. So if you happen to be in Western Australia, but so keep that uh, date reserved for that. And the third one is this uh, the certificate, the CPD certificate for the participants. So that's a new thing that we are introducing from this session. So that will uh, reach to uh if you provide your email address here or if you can catch your email address from the participation list yeah those are the things that i like to little bit highlight uh seneca or someone was trying to talk or no uh, i just uh, wish to congratulate for it's an excellent session for ocean it's a very demanding topic that you have given a very good uh, presentation here and also thank you for um, Matanga and Parakram for coordinating this session. Well, well, well done. Thank you very much. No worries. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Parakram. Yeah, thank thanks, you. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.